You are listening to the podcast of Calvary Church in Irwin, Pennsylvania. For more information, you can visit us online at calvaryirwin.com. Welcome, everyone. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Nick. I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, wanna, before we jump into uh, our, our message this morning, I want to share something I think is important. <clears throat> First of all, um, it's not necessary for me or anyone from the church to respond or comment on everything that happens in our world. Sometimes there's this tendency to think that everyone has to comment about everything, <clears throat> and we don't, okay? Um, but with that said, uh, over the last week or so, uh, if you're not aware, I'm sure you are, there's been a war happening in Israel. Uh, as Israel's been attacked and they're responding and, and there's so many things happening and it's so concerning uh, and worrisome. And I don't know how you land with that. Maybe to you it's just another thing. But it's, uh, it's concerning. And uh, for us as followers of Jesus, as Christians, um, we can have an emotional response to what's happening elsewhere. And sometimes it can cause us to be concerned, anxious. Uh, is the world coming to an end? <laughs> is, is this how it all comes to an end? What, what's, what's taking place here? And I just wanted to, to share, just very briefly, I'm not gonna preach because I have a whole message here, but I uh, wanted to share just very briefly and then pray uh, something to kind of put everything in context. So there's a war happening in Israel. There's one happening in Ukraine. There are other potential battles, wars happening elsewhere in the world. We find ourselves in a time in our own country where we can't agree on anything, where uh, our economy isn't at its best, where, where there are so many questions happening in our world. There are uh, hurricanes and storms and earthquakes and famines and, and all of this stuff happening in our world. And, and if we're not careful, the 24-hour news cycle can send us crazy. And we can find ourselves stressed, not because of anything happening in our lives directly, but because of what's happening in our world. And, and here's what I wanna share with you. In Matthew chapter 24, and I'll, uh, if you're not familiar, Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, second part of the Bible, the Gospel of Matthew, shares the life and teaching of Jesus. And it was written over 2,000 years ago, okay? So it's not like a recent bestseller. Um, it's, it's, it's an ancient document. Uh, and Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 that... Uh, there were these things that he referred to as uh, birthing pains. And what he meant by that was, it was a sign, he was using kind of a, a picture, uh, it's a sign of things that are yet to come. And he said that in the last days, in the end times, that there would be a number of things that happened. He said there would be uh, wars and rumors of wars, that a nation will rise up against a nation, that there would be earthquakes and famines and, and all this. And he said, but the end is yet to come. And, and, and when we see what's happening in our world, it can cause so much alarm. He actually said in Matthew 24, don't be alarmed when these things happen because I'm telling you now in advance. And, and when we see, you know, uh, one nation attacking Israel and, and, and then there's a potential of another uh, attacking Israel now and, and, and it can cause us to worry and, and it just looks like there's trouble coming, right? Well, what Jesus said in John 16, that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. What is our response to these things? Our response is twofold. One, to pray, because there are people involved. Put aside the governments, put aside the countries, put aside those things for a moment. There are people involved. Jesus didn't die for a country. He didn't die for a government. He didn't die for a policy. He died for people. And there are people involved. And we want to pray for that. And that's what we're going to do in a minute. Number two, we need, as followers of Jesus, we have a bigger picture. We have a grander picture of what happens in our world. It's not just what happens in the moment. It's the bigger picture that, that God is painting. It's the bigger story God is writing. And what is that bigger story? That we can have hope. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Of, of what is yet to come. There is something greater coming. Like, what we're experiencing is pain and sorrow and loss. But, take heart, he's overcome the world. Jesus is the blessed hope that he's returning, and not just that he's returning, but in Matthew, or in Revelation chapter 21, it says that he's making all things new. 
And, and I don't know what your, your, your belief on the end times is, if you have one at all, or, or uh, your approach to eschatology, which eschatology is essentially the study of the end times. Uh, there are a lot of different teachings on this, but, but here's just a broad stroke on that. The whole scope of this book we call the Bible, from Genesis to the beginning, that's the first book, to Revelation, the last book, has been the work of God's redemption of this world. And Revelation 21 what we see is the redemption, the restoration of all things. And there is coming a day when there will be a new heaven and a new earth where God redeems the pain, the brokenness, the destruction that's present in our world. And what do we do as Christians? We pray for the people involved and we hold on to the hope of what is yet to come. That this isn't the final moment. It can be so discouraging, uh, can bring so much anxiety, stress, and worry. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned, but I'm saying when that gets into our heart and our spirit, it can put us in a bad place. And God hasn't said everything's gonna be magical and you know, there's gonna be you know, unicorns flying around and everything's gonna be roses and, and this is how the world's gonna be because I want everything to be awesome. Jesus said in John 16, there's gonna be trouble, but take heart. In the end, he's overcome. So we hold on to that hope. With that said, I just wanna pray Pray for those involved in what's happening in Israel. And, and, and anything that happens in Israel, if you read, especially the New Testament, uh, is kind of a hotbed of, of end times events. Uh, we wanna pray for all those involved in Israel, but also those involved in wars elsewhere in Ukraine, those who are battling uh, in Sudan in a civil war right now. Uh, we wanna pray for the people affected and we could go on and on. We could spend a whole hour here praying for the people affected by issues in our world. Uh, but Jesus loves people, and we want to pray for them. And I want to pray that we can be people who have hope. Paul would later write that we should be ready to give an answer at any moment for the hope that we hold to. That we would be people of hope. That we wouldn't be the negative Nancys. Ap- apologize if your name is Nancy, but we wouldn't be, you know, those those people who are like everything's coming to an end. The world is collapsing. This is the end of the world. Um, can I tell you, for, for, if you read book, the book, this book, the Bible, the end of the world is painful, but it's beautiful because you get to see the redemption. That when Jesus, is, his return is drawing near, that, that's something we should have hope in, not something we should be afraid of. Um, and I don't just say that because we're gonna be standing in, in heaven with white robes singing worship songs for you know, eternity. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the redemption. When Jesus said in Revelation 21, I am making all things new, he's going to do that. And what a beautiful promise. That's what we put our hope in, all right? So enough of that. Uh, I wanna pray. And then we're gonna jump into to God's word this morning. So if you could bow your heads with me this morning. Lord, I pray this morning. God, that you would meet us in these places of difficulty, God, when we look on, watch the news or scroll online and we see the devastation, God, the, the suffering, the, the, the horrific things that are happening in the Middle East right now, God, we pray for those that are affected. God, you see loved ones who have been brutally killed. God, you see uh, people who have, been, who have died in, in attacks. God, you see the loss of life that is significant. And God, I know that breaks your heart. I pray it would break our hearts as well. God, I pray for comfort. God, I pray for peace, peace in Israel. God, peace across our world. God, I pray that that you would do miracles on that front. God, I pray that you would begin to protect, guard, Lord, guide the leadership involved. God, we pray for the people that you would let your love, your grace, your mercy shine through. Lord, the people of God would step up in these moments and God, be the helpers and be those that run into devastation to help those who are hurting and broken. God, I pray for the people today. God, I pray for us. God, that you would help us to be people of hope. Help us, Lord, to be people who hold to the hope of Jesus that you will one day make all things new, that you will one day return for your people, that you will one day heal, restore, and mend all that is broken by the destruction of our world. God, let us be people of hope. In our words, in our actions, in our responses, God, in what we put our time, resources, and influence toward, let us be people of hope. I thank you, God, that you don't leave us alone in these moments, 
that you've promised to walk through the valleys with us and you'll never leave us, forsake us. God, let us be people that know that you are with us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to, to turn our faces toward heaven, to find that our help comes from you. Thank you, God, for be, that we can be people of hope. God, that deep inside our hearts and our minds that we know that we can hold on to hope. God, let us live that out, not just in church, but let us live that out tomorrow at work, in our neighborhoods, and in our interactions. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, today, uh, we're, we're continuing a series, and uh, we've called it Don't Be an Idiot. Don't be an idiot. I'm not gonna tell you to turn your neighbor and say that because, you know, we don't wanna get anyone angry at you. But um, I wanna preface this just to kind of give you, uh, if, if you haven't been with us, if you have, but just preface this, that uh, I'm an idiot, and in some ways, we're all idiots, okay? So don't be an idiot isn't like we're saying you're an idiot, don't be an idiot. This is why the book of Proverbs is so important and valuable, and this month we're walking through the book of Proverbs. It's so valuable because in some ways we can all be idiots. We can all sometimes uh, fall short. We don't know everything. Uh, as much as we can find out on the internet, we don't know everything. And, and, and in those moments, and the posture we take is, God, I want to learn from you. I want to gain wisdom. And, and James in the New Testament says that uh, anything you ask of him, when you're asking for wisdom, he's going to grant it to you. And wisdom is one of the great things that we can embody. So uh, we're, we're talking about don't be an idiot. And when you came in this morning, those that are here in person, we gave you these cards. If you'd like to take notes, there's a little fill in the blanks and you can fill in the blanks to your heart's content. Uh, it's gonna be wonderful. If you hate filling in the blanks or if you're watching online and you just don't like, or you just don't like you know, writing things, if you scan, we have a QR code, we'll put up here on the screen for a second. If you scan that QR code, it's the same thing, but there's no blanks. So a little insider, if you want to know the blanks ahead of time, you can scan that. Uh, it's a little PDF there, and uh, um, you can get that. Or if you're watching online, you can scan it. If you're watching on your phone, I don't know how you're going to scan it, but I'm sure you're smart. You can figure it out. Um, so uh, you can follow along, and then on the back, there's, uh, we'll, we'll get to this in a second, some verses there. Uh, so in, in 1910, there was a, a young girl uh, by the name of Agnes Gancha Bonyaju. She was born to a family in the nor just north of Macedonia in what was then the Ottoman Empire. So we don't have the Ottoman Empire, if you don't know that. Uh, it was, at one point, it's not just something you put in your living room. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. So this was a long time ago, 1910. Uh, as a young girl, she was fascinated with the stories of missionaries. And, uh, and, and at the young age of 12, she determined that she was gonna give her life to God's work in this world in some fashion. At the age of 18, just a few years later, 1928, she would leave her home to join the Loretto Abbey in Rathfarnham, Ireland, and with the hopes of learning English to eventually fulfill her dream to become a missionary. The next year, she moved to the lower Himalayas in India where she learned Bengali and taught at St. Teresa's School near the convent she was at. She would take up her religious vows on May 24th, 1931, and chose to be named after Therese de Lezu, the patron saint of missionaries. In 1937, she would begin teaching at the Loretto Convent School in Entali in eastern Calcutta, India. And although she enjoyed teaching at this school, she was increasingly disturbed by the poverty that she was experiencing surrounding her in Calcutta. As she worked to care for the hurting, the poor, and the overlooked of Calcutta, she would eventually found this organization called the Missionaries of, of Charity in 1950. This would become the cause that she would give her life to. And, and she was striving to not only serve the poor of Calcutta, but to raise awareness of their cause through her work, and most importantly, through her words. This woman, born Agnes Ganche Bonyaju, is better known today as the beloved and revered Mother Teresa. She would transform the picture of Calcutta and the Calcutta slums through her tireless effort and most profoundly through the words that she would speak. She would say things that still, decades after her death, echo in our world. Statements like this, that not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. Or, or, or this, this quote, she said, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many 
ripples. And she, Mother Teresa, is part of this fraternity of individuals that through their powerful words have raised awareness for the cause of the overlooked, the abused, and the forgotten throughout modern human history. These are men and women like Harriet Tubman or Cesar Chavez or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who all recognized that actions were important, but an even greater toll to transform our world was the power of their words. The writings of women like Mother Teresa or Harriet Tubman, the speeches of men like Cesar Chavez or MLK have become legendary. And it's because they all recognized that there was such power, timeless power in their words. Now, we're in the middle of this series I mentioned called Don't Be an Idiot. And uh, we're, we're taking this modern uh, take on, a, on the statement in the book of Proverbs that says not to be a fool. And one of the ways foolishness has shown its head in our modern world is beyond the crazy kind of dumb things that people do just to get famous on YouTube, but, but the words, the words that people are using. It, it's, it's a little ironic, but today we wanna talk about how we can not be an idiot with our words. Uh, with the rise of social media's influence in our world, words have taken an even greater power than they ever had before. And it's never been easier to get your words out there for all to read. You know, in the past, uh, if, if you uh, wanted to get words out there, you, you had to get published just to, to get the words that you want to share, the statements you want to make, the things you want to get out to the world. You had to get published just to reach those outside of your sphere of influence. Today, everyone is published with platforms like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or, or, or Snapchat, our words can now be published with just a simple click. We no longer have to belabor our words to then be vetted by an editor or a publisher, but we can publish things that haven't even been fully proofread or thought out yet to the, to the whole world. And in modern times, words have consequently brought about so much good and so much destruction. They've sparked entire revolutions that have changed the course of nation's history or the history of entire people groups. Words have launched social media movements that have, uh, social movements that have brought about significant change. They've raised thousands of dollars for, for different causes and even brought about shifts in our society. And it makes me think of this quote from, from Mother Teresa. She said this, she said, kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. That our words continue on even beyond us. You see, there is no doubt that words have great power, but that power is both for the good and for the bad. And while words have always been important throughout human history, the power of our words, I believe, have never been greater. And yet the ability to be an idiot with our words has never been easier. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, It says this, the tongue, the tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. That that our words have the power of life and death. You've you've made those statements, those things that you wish you could retract. uh, those, Those things that you say and you're like, I wish I could get those words back in my mouth. You can't but they have the power of life and death. In in the message paraphrase of this verse, which is uh, kind of a translation, but more of a paraphrase of the Bible. It says this, that words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. What we read here is that there's significant powers, power in the words that we speak, the words that we write, and the words that we post. If we disregard or we're not aware of our words, we can easily do damage that we never intended to do. But when we're aware of the power that our words carry, we can allow our words to build a better world around us. And and this is the simple thought that I wanna share with you today, that words can build up or tear down, and the power of their impact is ultimately in our hands. They can build up or tear down, but the the impact they make, the power of their impact is in our hands. In other words, you have a choice, that you have a choice, I have a choice. Words aren't forced upon us. Words are one of the unique expressions of us. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 11, it says this, through the blessing of the upright, 
A city is exalted, and, and this isn't meaning the blessing like resources. This means the blessing like a spoken blessing. Through the spoken blessing of their upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. You think about what we can build around us through our words. And today I want to share with you just three areas where our words often make the greatest impact. Three areas that that we find our words can affect the world around us. The first one is this, the words we share with others. The words we share with others. Proverbs 11 verse 9 in the New Living Translation says, With their words, the godless destroy their friends, but knowledge will rescue the righteous. The words we speak to others have such a positive or negative effect. This is where the, the mantra we tell our kids is, I think, so wrong. We, we, you've probably heard this as a child growing up. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will what? Never hurt me. That is a lie, isn't it? I mean, if you haven't experienced the lie of that statement, you haven't left your house in like 30 years. Um, like that is a lie. If you're watching online, you haven't left your, left your house in 30 years, don't, because it's a lie, okay? Um, it, it, it's not true. I, I don't know about you, but hurtful words shared with me by people I thought cared for me or I care for have, have deeply, deeply hurt. They've done far more an- damage and harm than any physical attack, any injury, or every, any physical wound ever could. Words become weapons that don't simply injure us in a moment, but wound us in ways we don't even realize for years to come. That our words can actually wound people in ways that we never even intended, if we're not aware of them. One of the reasons for this is a physical injury happens in a definitive moment. Like there's a beginning and there's an end. Maybe you, you fall out of bed and you injure your back. Or, or maybe you just like sit up and you injure your back. I don't know where you're at on that. Um, or, 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 or someone runs a red light and T-bones you and you're sore for months. Or, or, or maybe someone's really angry with you, you know, and you're having this big debate over a budget at your work and they just whip around and punch you. That'd be really, you know, heated. It's like a hockey game, but uh, in your workplace. Like, in those moments, there's a beginning and an end to the injury, right? And, and you, you feel the lingering effects, but hopefully you get better. While those all hurt, they all have a clear beginning and end. When words become weapons, though, while they do have a beginning, they don't have an end. They continue to be relived and rehashed, often inflicting the same wounds over and over again. And you could probably relate to that in a lot of ways. This is why Proverbs 25 uh, what we see in Proverbs, the, the imp- imp- impact of our words, if we're not careful. Proverbs 25, 18, New Living Translation, it says, telling lies about others is as harmful as hitting them with an ax, wounding them with a sword, or shooting them with a sharp arrow. And I would argue that our words can actually hurt in a deeper way than any of those. You may be a person who is still living with the deep wounds of of a parent or a grown-up in your life when you were a child that spoke hurtful things over your life. And you're still working through that as an adult. Why? Because words can be deadly. They can be so hurtful. Now, what we just read there in in Proverbs 25 about our words and how they can be a weapon, this verse brings up, I think, an important distinction in our words. Sometimes we think our words, if we're not careful, our, our words toward others just need to be like all cheery and positive all the time. But that's not true. Uh, there are, the, the, what, what it says here is that lies, lies inflict pain, which means that our words should be grounded in truth. In other words, out of love for each other, we should still speak the truth, but do so out of a heart of love for them. That doesn't mean we're mean. It means that we shouldn't lie either. That makes sense? Like, just because some, you're trying to be nice to someone doesn't mean that you have to lie, but that we can be, uh, uh, do speak truth and love. It, the Apostle Paul 
wrote this to the Ephesian church, to young Timothy in Ephesians 4.15. In the New Living Translation, it's, he said, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. That when we can speak the truth, the words we speak over each other can be weapons, but they can also be building blocks. That when we can speak the truth, there's nothing that that, 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 that family member needs more than you to speak truth. Not like, hey, that habit you've got that's really destructive, just keep doing it. It's fine. That, that's not truth in love. The truth in love is, hey, I wanna help you through this. And I know it's really messing things up in your life and destroying things, but it's, it's a problem. How can I help you? That, that's a, out of a sacrificial love, an unconditional love. So, so our words can be weapons to harm someone, but if we are aware and intentional with our words, they can actually be tools to build up and help those around us grow. This is what we're talking about today, that words can build up or tear down, and the power of their impact is in our hands. In in Proverbs chapter 15, verse four, it says, the soothing tongue is a tree of life. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Our words, as followers of Jesus, our words should be expressions of life, not death. This is for anyone in our world, but especially for those that follow Jesus. After all, Jesus is referred in John's gospel as the word, the word. He was the greatest embodiment of God's word in this world. And if we are following Jesus, we're the embodiment of Jesus. We're uh, the big word, the incarnation of Jesus in our world. Our words should be life-giving. Our words should bring life, not death, not destruction. Does that mean that we lie about things just to smooth everything over? No, but we should speak the truth in love and build up, not destroy. As carriers of that message and mission, we haven't been placed in this world to declare curses over the world. We aren't called to destroy this world. No, we are here to create, to build, and to transform that which is broken. And words can build up or they can tear down. And the power of their impact is in our hands. God has placed it in our hands. He's placed it in your hands. That we have the choice. So the first area that our words can make an impact is the words we share with others. The second area is the words that we speak to ourselves. In Proverbs 18, verse 25, it says, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. You know one of the hardest people to be kind to? One of the hardest people to speak well of, the most difficult person to forgive, the most challenging person often to love is ourselves. The person you looked at in the mirror this morning. If you didn't look in the mirror, do something with your hair maybe. You, 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 you are the most difficult person to be kind to. Be, because we don't forgive ourselves for things. We, we often speak worse of ourselves. Here's, here's what uh, author uh, Dr. Brene Brown, she once said, she said this, I now see how owning our story and loving ourselves through that process is the bravest thing that we will ever do. Can I, can I be honest with you for a second, if that's okay? This is one of the hardest things for me. Self-talk. Self-talk. I don't know where you are, but I have a, a, an underlying voice to myself that is always negative. And it's so hard. Because how you speak to yourself dictates a lot of what you will or will not do dictates so much in your life. And the words that we hold to can build up or tear down. That's not just others. The power of their impact is in our hands. It's, it's for our lives. And I'm not talking just about positive self-talk or daily affirmations like Stuart Smalley once did on SNL where he would look in the mirror every day if you saw this sketch and he would say, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you. Maybe you wanna do that every day. Uh, that's not just what I'm talking about. Or, or, or uh, Abilene often said to little May in the movie, The Help, you is kind, you is smart, you is important. I, I'm, not, I'm not just talking about that. It's like just where you just say things to build yourself up. 
It's being able to recognize that your words about yourself and to yourself can transform who you are, how you are, and what you ultimately become. This isn't just about putting trust in yourself for simply your words, like uh, there's this force inside of you that just speaks things into existence. That's not what I'm talking about. It's allowing your self-talk to lay the groundwork to not become what you think your life should become, but who God says you should become. While our words toward others can be hurtful and destructive, the words we speak to ourselves or about ourselves, these are the true silent killers. Without realizing it, we begin to tear down the very things God is trying to build up within us. Negative self-talk isn't us just being humble, as we often think, but it becomes this crushing sledgehammer that swing after swing slowly crushes our spirit from the inside out. This is what I read earlier in Proverbs 15, four, where it said, the soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. We, we often interpret that verse as our words toward others, and that is important, but it's equally important our words toward ourselves. That a perverse tongue, a perverse tongue means a tongue that is contradicting, destroying what God is building up. A perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Maybe maybe you're here and you've been crushing your own spirit. You've been speaking over your life. All the destruction, all the mistakes of your past, all the reasons why you're not good enough and you don't have what it takes. You're you're destroying the beauty of what God has placed within you. This doesn't mean that we have to be prideful. It's not prideful to recognize that you are a child of God, a magnificent creation, a person fearfully and wonderfully made by God. That that, that doesn't mean that we, we won't make mistakes that, that we don't need God, but that we should honor what God has created, not just around us, but inside of us. I came across this quote recently that was written by a, an unknown rabbi. It's in a book that I'm going through, and, and, and I thought this was so profound. Here's, here's what he wrote. He said, a man should carry two stones in his pocket. On one should be inscribed, I am but dust and ashes. On the other for my sake was the world created. And he should use each stone as he needs it. One, I am but dust and ashes. The other, for my sake, the world was created. And this is the healthy middle that we find ourselves in as human beings, that that our self-talk and how we speak to ourselves should embody. That we are not trash, but we were created from dust. We are not the greatest thing in the world, but we were created with the greatest purpose in the world. If we can speak God's words over ourselves, if we can recognize how God views us, it's not just how we're speaking to other people because we can be kind to everyone around us and be the most loving person to those around us, but be a horrible jerk to our own selves. Be so mean and cutting to ourselves. We speak to ourselves in ways we would never talk to someone else. But do you know that God has just as much value in who you are and what you are as he does the other people? He created you for something greater. The first area we talk about is the, uh, that, that our words can have the greatest impact is the words we share with others. The second is the words we speak to ourselves. The third area is the words we share toward God. The words we share toward God. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse eight, We read, the Lord detests the sacrifice or the actions. The Lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked, but the prayer of the upright pleases him. Just a few verses later in verse 29 of that chapter, it says, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Aren't you thankful? Just a few minutes ago we prayed. It wasn't just some exercise of a religious obligation where we just recite things. But it says the Lord draws near He leans in to the prayers of the righteous. That when we cry out, he leans in. If you have kids, you know when your kids call your name, 
you know, it doesn't matter what time of the day or night you recognize it and you lean in. Like it, the, the, the cry of your children is something you lean into. Like God hears the cry of his children and he leans in. You might, might be like, I don't go to church. I, I, I don't even believe in God. Can I tell you something? He leans into your prayers still. He loves you deeply. You see, the words we speak toward others can transform our circumstances. The words we, we speak toward ourselves can transform us, but the words we speak toward God can transform the entire world. There's such power. We often forget the power of prayer. I believe strongly that the difference between the church in America surviving and ultimately thriving isn't simply dependent on our power or influence within our government. It's not simply dependent on our ability to gather more people or build bigger buildings. It's it's not even simply dependent on our efforts to reach unchurched people or to serve this community better. These can all be healthy, they can be beneficial, but I believe our ability as Christians to thrive in our world, in a fallen, broken world, is going to primarily be based on our strength, depth, and dependence on prayer. Like that, that one thing. And if we miss that, we can be well polished and have it all together, at least look that way, but we're missing the point. Our words toward God are more than good wishes and good vibes toward a higher power. No, prayer and speaking to God is our connection to the greatest force in our universe, the God that spoke everything into existence, the same God that heals the sick, raises the dead. That God can take the ugliest, most detestable life and transform it into something beautiful. That's the God that we're talking to. That's what prayer is about. This is the power of prayer that we should recognize the power of our words to build up those around us. We should realize how our words affect our own health and our own existence. But this last one is more than just a good practice. It is a necessity. I I love this quote by Dr. Jim Bradford. He said this, he said, if life is a run, if life is a run, then intimacy with God is our oxygen. If life is a run, then intimacy with God is our oxygen. We don't pray just because it's a good idea or a best practice. We speak to God because it is our lifeblood as followers of Jesus. It's not something we just do on Sundays. It's something we do every day. This is why Paul encouraged those he was writing to, to pray continuously. Some translations say pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean that we close our door and we sit there 24 seven and pray and God's just gonna magically pay your bills and like everything's gonna work out. That's not what he's talking about. That you have this attitude, this ongoing conversation, this attitude of prayer in every area of your life that even as you go to work, as you go into a meeting, as you uh, uh, wake up in the morning, that you have this attitude of prayer because it's our lifeblood. It's not just something that we do out of religious obligation. It's something we get to do to be connected to the power of our creator. This is such an important area. And these, these are the three areas where our own words can make such an impact. The words we share with others, the words we speak to ourselves, and the words we share toward God. They make such an impact. As the worship team comes this morning, there, there's one set of words that I haven't mentioned though, that can actually make a pretty big impact on our individual lives. It's not our words toward others or ourselves or toward God. It's God's words toward us. Do you know God speaks words over us? See, we've talked about words can build up or tear down and the power of their impact is in our hands. God speaks words over us and he's given us a choice to receive them or reject them. And, And how we live our lives, how we live out those other three is largely dependent on our ability and willingness to receive his words about us. See, we can in our own effort or power strive to speak well of others and to others. We can work to practice good self-talk and even acknowledge God and talk to him every once in a while. But if we miss God's words toward us, we miss the entire context that all that takes place in. See, God, God looks down from heaven at you 
with such joy, with such love, with such an expectation. He doesn't just endure you. He doesn't just put up with you. Maybe your spouse just like puts up with you. He doesn't just put up with you. And he doesn't even just love you. He actually likes you. He likes your presence. He likes being around you. He likes being a part of what you're doing every day. He enjoys you because he created you. He shaped you. The God we are talking about speaks life over you. He speaks divine purpose over you. Contrary to what some might think, he isn't out to destroy you or ruin you or, or make your life miserable. You see, the greatest threat to the modern man or woman isn't global warming. It's not wars, disease, or famine. All of those are concerning, but the greatest threat to our existence is forgetting what God has spoken over us. A, 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 a distorting our identity and what that identity is grounded in. What I mean by that is our tendency, meaning the human race's tendency, is to forego the words our infinite, all-knowing creator speaks about us in exchange for an identity and words that our finite culture defines us by. Your identity, your identity, my identity, is not based on what you do, who you're with, where you live. Your identity isn't based on how much money you earn, what title you carry, or what family you grew up in. Your identity is shaped from the moment you were formed in your mother's womb. Psalm chapter 139 says this, for you created my inmost being, that God created your inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Listen to this, verse 14. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. There, there are words, there are words that have been spoken over your life. Maybe they're still spoken over your life by people in your life that deeply hate you or, or people in your life that are deeply broken and don't know how to process it and they're speaking death over your life, curse over your life. And you have bought into that and you have listened to it and you have embodied it and your life as it is right now is a, is a direct result of the words you have accepted from others. Today, I want you to take a moment and to release those because your creator, the one who shaped you, not just some distant God, not just some religious figure, not just some you know, idol or, 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 or religious thing, the God that made you and shaped you in your mother's womb said, I fearfully, I wonderfully made you. You're not an accident. You're not a failure. You're not a disaster. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And throughout scripture, there are these words that God has spoken over you. These aren't verses. These aren't verses that uh, were written to one specific person. They were written to you. On the back of that card you got has a lot of these statements. This is what God speaks over you. That we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. That you are God's handiwork. You are shaped and formed by him. Every little nook and cranny and every little nuance of who you are, you are God's handiwork. That you are a chosen people. You know, I grew up uh, in middle school. I was always the last kid picked in gym class. I don't know if any of you were there. I was like the shortest kid. I had glasses. I, I didn't look the part. I didn't look like the kid that's gonna like kick the ball for a home run and kickball or, or, you know, make the basket in basketball or, you know, win at dodgeball or whatever games we played in gym. Uh, it, it's tough when you haven't been chosen. God is chosen. You are a chosen people. A royal priesthood, you carry, you carry royalty in your blood. You're a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Romans 8, 37 says, in all these things, you, we are more than, what's it say, conquerors. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. We aren't those that, we aren't survivors. I don't care what the song says, like we aren't just survivors. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
Galatians 4, 7. It says, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. Can you put your hand on your heart for a second? Can you just say this with me? I am God's child. Can we say it one more time? I am God's child. Do you understand the weight of what that means? You're not just another person. You're not just another face. You're not just taking up uh, more room on this earth. You are God's child. He loves you. He cares for you. You're no longer a slave. You're no longer a hired hand. You're not just someone that God is saying, do this for me and do that for me like you're some servant. You were God's child and since you are his child, he didn't just stop there. God makes you also an heir, an heir of his throne, an heir of his power, an heir of his authority. That's who God has made you. And I'm not sharing all this to make you feel warm and fuzzy. But there's power in our words, the words we speak about others, the words we speak to ourselves, the words we speak to our God. But, but there is equally power in the words that God has spoken over you, that God has spoken about you. And most importantly, that God is speaking directly to you. Those words that God speaks about us are what drive the words you share with others, the words you speak to yourself, the words you share to our God. That should drive us. And, and before we, we close this morning, maybe you're here and, and, and church is like the furthest thing from your mind, like you just wandered in or someone invited you and, and, and you don't normally come to church or maybe you've been coming to church, but you haven't lived your life in the context of his words. You know, there are different words like in a different sentence mean different things, right? You know, like uh, kids these days say things are bad and, and sometimes it's like, bad like not good and sometimes it's bad like really awesome I don't know if kids say, say those things anymore but you, you get what I'm saying like a word in different sentences can change meaning right your life the words that you embody they change meaning depending on what sentence they're in depending on the context right maybe you're here and you've been living your life you've been trying so hard to make it I'm not just saying financially or with your job or any of, or your relationships. I'm saying you've just been trying to make it. And every day, every week is a struggle. And you're just working and working and working and you're exhausted and you're worn out and you don't know if you can make it anymore. Can I tell you some good news? That your life can be in the context of one that doesn't ask you just to make it. Your life can be in the context of one that says you can be more than a conqueror. That your life in God's hands aren't a matter of you being religious all of a sudden, being a religious person. It's about you stepping into your divine purpose and reason for being and recognizing all the mistakes that you hold against yourself, all the wrong you hold against yourself and others hold against you. The Bible calls that sin, that God can forgive you of that and have a future for you. That's what John 3, 16 says, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him doesn't have to die or perish, but we can have eternal life, that we can have a future, a hope that we talked about earlier. And if you're here today, I don't wanna rush through and get out of here without missing the opportunity to say, you know what? God, I wanna receive the words that you're speaking toward me. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer what the Bible calls a sinner. I'm no longer defined by my mistakes and my past. I am a child of God and I'm gonna live my life in the context of that. Would you bow your heads with me this morning, everyone? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the words you speak over us. I thank you, Lord, for the incredible opportunity you give us, Lord. You invite us to not just be followers, to not just be friends or fans, but you invite us to be children of God. You forgive our past. God, that you commit to pursue us and to help us pursue that divine purpose you put within us when you fearfully and wonderfully made us. God, I pray for those that are here, those watching online that have been trying so hard on their own and their own ability and power just to make it. I pray today is a day where the page is turned 
And God, they begin to live their life in the context of what you have spoken about them and what you have made possible because Jesus of your sacrifice on the cross. As you're continuing to pray this morning, if you're here and you've never taken the step to say, you know what, I wanna receive the forgiveness of Jesus. I, I wanna live for his purpose. I wanna live my life in the context of what he has said about me, that I'm no longer a slave, but I can be a child of God. If that's you this morning, I'm gonna ask you to do something physical act of your will. Just to, in a minute, I'm gonna count to three. I'm gonna ask you to reach your hand toward heaven. Between you and him to say, God, today is a day that I begin a new chapter. Today is the day that I begin to live for you, not for me. Today is the day that I begin to, to receive what you've said about me. If that's you, on the count of three, one, two, three. If that's you this morning, just reach your hand toward heaven. Amen, amen. Anyone else today? Amen, amen. You can put your hands down. I'm gonna ask everyone to pray this prayer with me. As I mentioned earlier, these are words we speak to our God's a conversation. My hope is that maybe if this is your first time doing this, that you would continue those conversations and share those words with God, that you recognize the power and depth that prayer can have in your life. Would you all pray this prayer with me together? Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for seeing me where I am. Thank you for not giving up on me. Today I accept your words. I accept your forgiveness. I commit to live for your divine purpose. Give me the strength and the courage to follow you all the days of my life and to show your love to the world around me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I wanna encourage you to not stop there. If you stop by the Connection Center, we have a booklet we wanna put in your hands to help you continue that journey. Or, or if you go to connect.calvaryirwin.com and there's a button there that says, hey, I'm committing to follow Jesus, you can fill that out and we'll get it to you digitally. For, for all of us today, what are the words you're speaking over others? What are the words you're speaking toward yourself? What are the words you're speaking toward God? We need to be aware of the power of words. In the, as we mentioned earlier, in, in the power of the tongue is life and death. One of the reasons we gave you this card today isn't just so you can fill in blanks. Hopefully you enjoy filling in blanks. But on the back of it, these are some of the verses, these are some of the words that God speaks over you. If you struggle with that, which I think a lot of us probably do, can I encourage you to put this somewhere where you're gonna see it and be reminded? Maybe it's on your mirror. For some of you, maybe it's, you know, uh, next to your TV. Maybe, maybe for some of you, it's like right where the cookies are. You just hang it right there. When you grab a cookie, you can remind it, oh, God loves me. Man, this is good too. Well, wherever, that, wherever that works for you, put it somewhere to remind you of the words that God speaks over you. You are not a mistake. You're not a failure. You are a child of God. He loves you so deeply. And please hear me. I'm not saying that to give you warm and fuzzies, make you feel all good. Those aren't my words. Those are his. I'm just communicating them to you. God loves you so much. Don't you ever forget that. As you go through your day today, as you go through your week this week, recognize that how you respond and speak to others, how you respond and speak to yourself, and how you talk to God should be the result of what God has spoken into your life and over your life. We've been reading through the book of Proverbs, if you've been with us, and the cool thing about the book of Proverbs is there's a 31 chapters and there's 31 days in October. You see the connection there? So today is October 15th, so you can read from Proverbs 15. Tomorrow's Proverbs, uh, October 16th, you can read from Proverbs 16. Let God's words speak to your life. Let his words speak over your life and change how you live your life and the words you use. Before we go, can I pray for you? Pray that God would just bless you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for the words you speak over us. God, I thank you that you didn't just make us and walk away. But God, that you see such value in each of our lives, that you love us so deeply. God, that you continue to pursue us. You continue to speak over us. God, I pray you would help us in those difficult moments. God, where we're tempted to say things to others or post things online that could be hurtful or destructive, Holy Spirit, check us that we recognize our words can build up, not tear down. God, in those moments that negative self-talk where we start to tear ourselves down, speak 
down to ourselves. Holy Spirit, that you prompt us and remind us that we are a child of God. We are God's creation. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. God, in those moments that we try to go at our own and we forget, we forget in the power of prayer, the words we can speak toward God. Holy Spirit, remind us that we can tap into the greatest force in this universe, the creator, the God who can do all things. God, I thank you for what you're doing in us and what you're gonna do through us. God, I pray you would bless us. Let your face shine upon us, Lord. Grant us and our world peace in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you guys for joining us today. Next week, we're gonna be continuing our series talking about uh, don't be an idiot with your work. We're gonna be talking about how we live for Christ and how we live for God in our workplace. So invite a friend. We'll see you guys next week. Have a great week. God bless you guys. This is Pastor Nick Pohl, the lead pastor at Calvary. We're so glad you joined us for today's podcast. I hope you enjoyed the message. At Calvary Church, we're passionate about leading people into an overflowing life with Jesus. We would love the opportunity to connect with you on your faith journey and hear what God is doing in your life or join you in prayer for any needs you might have. You can visit us online at calvaryirwin.com or send us an email at info at calvaryirwin.com. On our website, you'll find previous week's messages, a list of upcoming events, as well as resources designed to help you take those next steps on your journey of faith. See you next week, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. 